Hello Bushmasters, it's BTG. Welcome to another episode of Semi-Indestructible, proudly presented in partnership with the Wild Times podcast and sponsored by Adventure Beast, the animated wildlife comedy series streaming worldwide now on Netflix. First, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, got a lot of great feedback from the last episode in regards to uh, pain and how to deal with it both physical and mental, a lot of people out there, to no surprise to me, but still gratifying, uh, struggling on recovery after injuries, comebacks, uh, setbacks in their life emotionally. And it was great to talk to Evan Nelson and get some insights on appropriate ways to continue your recovery to be the best version of yourself. And one of the reasons you want to be the best version of yourself is there's a lot of life to live, a lot of things out there, a lot of grand plans. Now, don't get me wrong. Ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, on the infinite cosmic timeline, we uh, are just, I don't know, a tiny cock stain on the hem of infinity. But that doesn't mean we can't get up to a great deal. And today's show is all about learning from your mistakes, hard-won wisdom from adventures in the field. Let me give an example. I used to be madly into dirt bike racing, specifically desert racing. So enduro racing, Paris to Dakar, like stuff, Baja, uh, the Australian Safari, uh, you know, all the great uh, long-distance off-road desert races. And I ride dirt bikes. I had a little fleet of KTMs, some 550s, 660s, adventurers. I had a bunch of bikes. And, you know, obviously I wrecked them all at various points in time, and I wrecked myself. There was one particular race I want to talk about because I learned a really important lesson, and it was this. Things will continue to go wrong whether you like it or not. You cannot put an end cap on mistakes that lead to other mistakes. In machine gun terms, we call it a runaway. It just goes off on its own. So let me explain what happened. I was on my way to this race. It's a wonderful two-day event in uh, central New South Wales called the Yellow Mountain Rally. It's from uh, Condobolin to Tottenham and back. Uh, roughly off-road, off roughly 100 miles each way. Not a huge race. It's a great shakeout before you get to the multi-day events that go on for a week or so. Great test of equipment, great test of your fitness. Now, I'd had a number of injuries. I didn't come to this race feeling 100%. I also took my big weapon bike, my big 660. I didn't take my lighter 550 because I wanted to make sure the setup was right for the big races. So I had a heavier bike, and it was just a little shakeout event. Anyway... I got this crazy uh, infection on the inside of my nose, turning this giant pussy abscess thing. And uh, I should have said, okay, I run down, I should stop, but I didn't. Instead, I got a very sharp knife, I stuck it up my nose, and there was a great gush of blood and pus and gore. I had a cameraman with me, we were shooting a doco, he almost fainted. It was all pretty revolting, but my nose felt pretty good after that. So let's go do the thing. Got there to the start line. Now, in these big events, they have a thing called a prologue. It's kind of like a qualifying race, and it's a pre-race. And basically, on your time, they determine where you start because everyone goes off you know, a minute or two apart uh, on these. Remember, there's no roads. It's just navigating. So we don't want everyone crashing into each other. Uh, so we're all staggered in the start. Prologue race, not a problem. The key is not to overdo it. In off-road racing, in desert racing, you actually don't want to be first off the line. If you have to make tracks, as they say, it's tougher because you have to do a lot more thinking. Whereas if you can see someone else's track, or better still, uh, a number of other tracks all going the right direction, it, it saves you time in navigation. Head off on the on the prologue, nice and easy. I'm not trying to win anything. And yet somehow hit some greasy clay amongst the trees, went over, boom, straight in the elbow, I popped my shoulder right out. Now you remember in a previous episode, I talked how I ruined my shoulder in the Russian space program. This is the consequence. Now I could knock it out of the socket. Pretty painful. Grab my hand, put it over the handlebars of the motorbike, rip my body back, pop my shoulder back in, finish the prologue, and now I'm in the bottom 10% of all the riders. Thing is, now I've got an inflamed shoulder that's been dislocated, probably should have stopped, but it's feeling okay. So I go ahead. The race starts. I take off. So many riders in front of me. Many are on slower bikes than me. Many of them are less experienced riders. And I have this very clearly defined path to follow. I'm eating them up. I'm just absolutely eating them up. So I come from the back of the pack, 
So by the end of the first day, I'm in the top half of the field. Fantastic day, great riding. I've got hot packs on my shoulder. Uh, it swells up overnight. The next day I can hardly move it, but I'm just like, to hell with it. I made up so much ground. Can I get in to the front of the group? Probably should have stopped. I didn't. What I did is I decided to really make up as much ground as I could in the first sort of 20 miles because once we get into the trees and there's powder-like talcum dust, it just you can't see, can't pass. So I wanted to gobble up all the slower bikes, you know, in the first 20, 30 miles. Went a bit too fast, caught in a cloud of dust, went straight into an irrigation ditch, hit the other side, bent my knee backwards, fell off the bike. Agony. Probably should have stopped. But I got back on my bike. I thought, to hell with it. I'm already dinged up. The bike's going. I'll just finish the race, which I did. And I fell off a few more times. End of the day, I had a damaged shoulder. I had a busted knee. I, I absolutely did a number on my bike. And for what? Yeah, I finished a race. It was great fun. Ended up a little trophy. But I wasn't able to compete in the Australian Safari because I was back in hospital getting surgery. I had so many red flags saying now is the time to stop. Everything went back to the first moment when I stuck a knife up my snout and decided that would make me race fit. It was a great lesson. You know, know when to turn around. Know when to stop because things are only going to get worse. And once they get worse, there's nothing to stop them from getting even worse again and even worse again. And that's why I have so much admiration for, for mountaineers like Lincoln Hall and others who, you know, didn't get to the top of Mount Everest on their first or second or third attempts, even though they're great climbers, because they could see the weather coming in and they turned back, whereas a lot of people were too desperate, too ignorant, too stupid, too greedy, too desperate, got to the summit and died there. Um, so that was one of the hard one lessons I had was getting through that two-day race. Wasn't a big race, but it had a lot of big consequences for me uh, going forward. And that's what I want to share with you today. A bunch of experiences where I made mistakes and got hurt and learned something useful that made me better in the field later on. Now, I can't cover a topic about monumental screw-ups resulting in misery and suffering and embarrassment subsequently leading to bearded wisdom if I don't get one of my best mates the absolute Bushmaster Supreme and the granddaddy of this podcast, this podcast business, your mate and mentor, the broologist, Forrest Galante. <laughs> Hell of an intro. And you're right. When it comes to stupid decisions, I am your guy <laughs> every, every time. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's funny because in the world of making big, stupid mistakes and bad choices, there's not many people that I look up to, but you're one of them. There's no question Thank you. about it. Yeah. Thank you. you know, I'll, I'll take that, the ignominious uh, honor. I mean, I just think, particularly you and I, because you've done so much adventuring, so much traveling, so much handling wildlife that was dangerous. And I will say this, as you and I both know, and, and the listeners and viewers may not appreciate till I spell it out, much of what makes our job dangerous doesn't happen on camera. It's... Yeah. Yep. Getting to, getting back, things going wrong in transit. It's crappy planes. It's it's broken cars. It's boats that sink. It's it's all that stuff. Uh, and and there's no. I I really don't want to sell the glamour of it because it's not the glamour. It's the grind no. yeah. that makes these things possible, right? Hey guys, if you're enjoying, whoops. Guys, if you like the wild times, check us out on Patreon. We put out four extra podcasts per month. That's one commute a week that you're just going to be laughing and learning the whole time in the car. <laughs> hey, let me do, do something else. This is the late night content, the stuff that we, we can't show on, on YouTube because they'll kick us off YouTube. It's the Cinemax of podcasts. <laughs> Uncensored, raw dog. It's the Cinemax of podcasts. Check it out. Link right here. I think it's, it, you know, it, knowing when to say no is probably for people that are, incredibly passionate and overly motivated and enthusiastic to accomplish whatever it is, whether it's a motorcycle race, finding a, a animal that's hard to find, spearing a fish, whatever it happens to be, is one of the hardest challenges there is. It's, it's, and it's, <laughs> I can, I can, and I probably will tell a whole bunch of stories of stuff that people would never even know happened to me that have seen the shows, you know, tearing mm. my groin in South Africa, my whole leg Ouch. turned black. 
And uh, oh, it was brutal. I still, I still have a pretty major nagging injury from it. it's completely wrecked my rugby. Not that I was ever going anywhere with it, but it's completely wrecked my uh, my my fantasy career that was taking place in my head. And um, you know, I couldn't say no. I was in the middle of a shoot. I had a whole team depending on me. And at the end of the day, we found three lost species of shark that we set out to find. And yeah. I don't regret it. Like, I, I don't regret that I now have a nagging injury that will never go away. But every time I feel that little pain in the groin, I, <laughs> it makes me think of those three lost sharks that we found. Um, but I had no choice. And there are other times where I had a choice and I pushed through something similar to that. And we can get into those mm. specifics. And, uh, and it resulted in nothing. And because it resulted in nothing, I now yeah. have, you know, I now have one arm. You can't really see it. That, that's shorter than the other arm and will be for life. Is and, that right? um, and, and nothing. Yeah. I, I broke this elbow, two compound fractures in different areas. That's a bad joint to break. That's a very a bad, bad one, a bad one. And nothing, nothing will ever, you know, it, it wasn't a big, I was young. It wasn't like I was on a major expedition, but I was just pushing myself too hard. And, Injuries, um, you know, yeah, they have consequences it, though. You, you have, have a, a serious injury, like any of you mentioned now getting older obviously makes everything suck exponentially, but let me, uh, let me, let's, let's, so let's, let's go tit for tat. Let's just go back and forth and on a theme, try to come up with some moments. I'll give you an example. And first of all, I want to say that sure. special you did for shark week. And I, I remember I spoke to you, I called you afterwards. I said, that is the yeah. best show of this year on shark oh, week. Thanks, by far. It was Thank so you, good. I'm, was I'm so sorry. Fun. I'm sorry that your groin was, was rent asunder like cheap sheets. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what a great show. So I tell you, I, here's a, here's a, here's something where there was nothing at stake. And I did a stupid thing. I had some, obviously a lot of shoulder injuries and I had a bunch of rebuilds, but I was doing a photo shoot for a, a, a newspaper magazine. Now newspaper mm -hmm. magazines don't sound glamorous, but they get massive readership because they're put inside the newspaper. And so millions of people sure. will see them. Sure. So I, and they, I went to a, a zoo I won't name and I borrowed a snake. <laughs> it, was a, it was a decent sized Burmese python and I had it on my shoulders and whatever for the photo. So it would look cool. And I, I want to be clear. That was what at stake. Nothing was more at stake than just looking cool. That was, you know, right. And, yep. and put it on and the photographer, not a wildlife guy. And he's taking his time, moving the lights, trying to get it. So, and it's like, he's not working with much. So obviously he's struggling and he's trying to make me look pretty. <laughs> and it went, and it went on and the snake started to move out. It was quite a large snake and it started to move out across my arm. So my arm comes up, I'm holding it up. I just kept holding it there while they're trying to get the photo. And in the end, it, the weight was too much and it gradually tore my you know, injured rotator cuff. Oh, no, so no, just from holding the snake. <laughs> just from holding the snake for about, you know, 20 minutes out, you know, in like a stress position. And I remember yep. I had a, a series of injuries there before, so I already had some damage. I ended up with a torn rotator cuff, not a massive injury, but an annoying one that takes Nagging. a lot of power out of your arm for a long time. And I remember thinking, what a moron. What is my vanity that I would right. rather pretend that I'm super tough and can take the pain? Yep. And instead of just saying, hey, this is hurting, I need a break and maybe change arms. That, so putting vanity before uh, physical function injury, big mistake, and I learned from that. What about you? I'll give you a good one. We've talked about this on the Wild Times very briefly. I don't think I've ever gone into, into depth on it. When we were in Madagascar, Patrick was with us. We were trekking um, to this, this area. We were looking for uh, evidence of dwarf hippo, pygmy hippo. And, oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Super cool shoot. We were in this incredible area and there was a place that was, uh, it was basically a six hour drive from where we were staying. That was supposed to be one of the most cinematic and incredible places in all of Western Madagascar. And this is making TV. So we knew the likelihood of finding a hippo there was very, very, I mean, the likelihood was always slim, but the likelihood of finding one there was basically non-existent because it was the wrong <laughs> type of habitat. But it was so beautiful and so cinematic that we're like, let's spend a day going there and filming and getting B-roll and shots of forest hiking through here and, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, great, love it. It's like one of these major nat natural wonders of the world. I, I wish I could remember the damn name of the place, but it'll come to me um, in Western Madagascar. And we're like, let's go. This will be incredible. Now, during this time of preparation, there was some sort of viral Montezuma's revenge running through the crew. Um, oh and, yeah, the welcome to Madagascar yeah. that everybody gets. Yeah, everybody, and it was bad. I mean, I've had it in. I've had Bali Belly. I've had Montezuma's. I've had them all. 
And yeah, this was the yeah. worst that I'd ever faced. And so at 5 p.m. the day before, we're going to take the six-hour drive and go and do this this hike just for beauty shots. Again, just for vanity. Yeah. Um, I, my my tummy starts to gurgle, and I'm like, oh, God, it's hit, hitting me. Now, six of the eight guys that have had it so far have literally shit their beds. And now, I'm not, I'm oh, not yeah. saying that figuratively. Literally, no, they've no, pooped no. in their beds. You, I, yeah. I spoke to you guys as we were changing <laughs> over. I was coming into countries. You were coming That's out. Right. That's right. And I remember yep. you saying, you know, everyone's going to shit themselves. And uh, – and I went, okay, yeah, it could be. And I and I had prepared for it. I had different strands of antibiotics with me just yep. in case. And no, every single member of the crew, chocolate rooster yep. tail, you know, liquid turtle, it was happening to everybody. So yeah, I 100% <laughs> so believe you know. So you yeah, know. 100%. And uh, Singy was the name of the place we were trying to get to. It's super oh, remote. Oh, Singy, yeah, T-S-I-N-G-Y. Yeah. Yep. And incredible rock formations, everything else. Anyway, yeah. so this thing hits me at night. And I'm like, oh, everybody's depending on me. I got to, I got to see Singy. I've got to, got to get out there. You know, I've got to be a part of it. I spend all night, you know, with stuff coming out both ends in the fetal position on the floor of the shower all night. Don't get a lick yeah. of sleep. And sunrise cracks up. And this is again, it's entirely for vanity. I knew there was not going to find a hippo there. I knew it didn't even matter. And I drag myself to the car, literally lie down in the bed of the truck again stuff coming out both ends the whole way there feeling as rotten as rotten <laughs> I gets. Feel, i feel so bad for you <laughs> oh and then i and then we get there and they're like okay it's really been muddy from the rains it's about an hour and a half hike from here to sing oh no and, and it's you know it's madagascar it's 105 degrees out 100 percent humidity and to try and make the story short i i make it maybe three or four miles and i just lie down on the trail pants around my ankles lying yeah. down sideways on the trail oh, and go man. i just i just can't and i've never before thrown in the towel it's amazing i made it through the drive and three yeah, miles yeah, into yeah. the trail and i got so so much more sick because i got dehydrated and heat stroke from trying to yes. get to thingy that it ruined the next like four days where i should have been expeditioning much harder to look for the hippo in an area that could have actually potentially had a hippo or had yeah, hippo yeah. remains and instead, by pushing myself so hard that one day, four shots that didn't really matter or make any difference in the world, that it ruined the next four days and drastically reduced our chance of success of finding oh, the animal that, that over hurts. the shoot. Yeah. That and hurts. I, and I, I, you know, look, I wasn't that young. I was, this was five or six years ago. And I look back and think, why? Why? Yeah. Well, I could have been so easy to be like, look, you guys go to Singy. I'll miss out, which I never want to do. And that's a big problem is the fear of missing out. But I was like, you guys go to sing, you get yes. beautiful shots and B-roll and see it and enjoy it. And by yeah. the time you get back tonight, my little Montezuma's revenge will have passed. And tomorrow we're back on the main mission. But instead, I, I fucked myself for like five straight days. I, feel, I mean, first of all, I love that you invented the fecal fetal ball. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I love so that bad. that's now, that's so now a thing. Um, well, you know, it's, it's interesting that uh, we had a uh, had a uh, had a had a similar medical emergency. Uh, we went down to southern southern uh, rainforest there, mm -hmm. and we were looking for little those little the world's smallest mouse lemurs. I remember, and, I remember, and tiny creatures. So, uh, director on Little Giants, Mike Gross, lovely guy. He did he did Friday Night Fights uh, for History Channel. He did um, uh, he did Mountain Men, and he did little he directed Little Giants. He is a fit, strong guy, and he's driven. Now, here's the thing about wildlife shows that you and I know, the people that don't realize, it's chaos. Yep. You go there with an agenda, and then nature decides what you're going to do. It could uh, be hour anything. one, I always say this. I don't mean to interrupt you, but no, I always no, no, say please. this. You go in, you spend six months prepping, planning, having this whole structure and schedule and idea, and it's usually like hour three, day one, that you're like, crumple that up, throw it over, and let's fucking, let's wing it from here. Because it just goes so to true. shit immediately. Um, but yeah, anyway, you have to have – yeah. well, that's a good lesson too. It's having backup plans and knowing – I remember mm -hmm. Mike Tyson saying you go – everyone goes into the ring with a plan until they get punched in the face. And right, that's exactly. exactly. Exactly what it's – is exactly what it's like. So you yep. always leave a half day or a day of recon. Even though you've done months of research, uh, yep. you go in there and you, you'll see what Mother Nature gives you and you just got to suck it up and try and make it into something interesting. So Mike was great at that and he got in there. But he'd been working so hard, he wasn't eating enough, he wasn't keeping his fluid up, he wasn't resting. And uh, and don't get me wrong, I got sick there. I got sick on another leg in Laos. We all got sick. But I remember saying to him, "Hey, this is not, this is there's no finish line to this. We gotta right. we gotta stay in shape. We can't work ourselves into the ground because the ground right. will swallow us up." And 
He was just working so hard. He wasn't eating, wasn't drinking, got dehydrated, stinking hot, obviously, in Madagascar at that time of year. Yeah. And he had a similar thing to you. I mean, we had no power. We had a little generator. So we had no power in these little huts. And he, in the middle of the night, gets up, uh, no lights, goes to puke and, and crap, his, crap himself to death. And he, <laughs> and, and he, he they had this, these plates, these soap dishes that were just really a, 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 a small plate. And he sort of fell on it and gashed, gashed himself. And he was feeling so nauseated and disorientated. He just, instead of going through the darkness to wake one of us up in a different hut, he just went back to bed, woke up in the morning feeling even worse, did the same thing almost identically but passed out and then hit his head on cool. the side of this concrete basin and fell unconscious on the ground. Oof. I'm at breakfast at 5 a.m. getting ready for the sun to come up um, and we start shooting and I'm the only member of the party that speaks any French and it's not great French. Yeah. Uh, and they come to me to explain that it sounded like there's a dead man in the hut. I'm like, I couldn't have heard that correctly. So <laughs> I go I go to the hut with uh, Teresa, the wolf mother Garcia, our, uh, <laughs> our production manager to see what's going on. And Mike is just ruined. I mean, his arm is like, looked like he he'd put his hand into a blender, uh, got a big gash on his head. Anyway, we then had to, no roads, we're on an island. We then had to put him in a boat, take him a few hours to the nearest hospital. I wrote down basic instructions for him in my pigeon French to give to the doctor. To, to, and he came back, you know, he lost a couple of days uh, yeah. in hospital. And it could have been a lot worse. At least we had a hospital a few hours away. Um, but the lesson there is, you know, once you start feeling bad, you got to take those precautions yeah. immediately. And as you say, the cure is, in that case, it's take you. Make sure you pack your antibiotics for your gut. You, you pack your uh, tablets, your ammonia if you're going to, you know, you have a lot of diarrhea. It's just part of life. It's just another form of illness. And you take your electrolytes, you take your pain relievers, and you rest and you rehydrate. And you could have, as you said, you could have gotten out of all of that misery if you had known yep. when to stop. And as yep. you said, the difference between a rookie and a professional so often is knowing when to stop and regroup in order to make the mission a success. And it's a delicate balance, right? Because at least for myself, and I, I know you well enough to know you're the same, you always just want to push through. Oh, I'll yeah. be fine tomorrow. I'll be fine in three hours. I'll push through it. And having enough self-awareness to not be mm -hmm. a nervous, cautious wreck and try and stop yeah. down everything, but to be like, okay, this is the point of no return. If I do this, I'm ruining everybody else's opportunity, chance, whatever it is, versus if I just stop down now, put my tail between my legs and fix myself, then everybody wins in the long run. And it's that short-sightedness versus long-sightedness that I think uh, is, it's really hard. And it doesn't matter how many accidents you've had or how many stupid decisions you've made. There's always those pivotal moments in a trip and an expedition and a shoot where you're like, what is the right decision? Do I push through it because I want this thing? Or do I try and stop down, which can make it difficult on everybody? And the thing that I've come to realize, and this is sad, and it's sad to even admit out loud, it never I, fucking matters, right? When we no. were on Animal Planet, you and I were both on Animal Planet. What a waste of time, right? And I know I know that there's Animal Planet executives that listen to this, and I'm sorry, guys. You know who you are, and I love you guys, and they'll text me, and that's okay. What a waste of time, right? I loved Extinct or Alive. It was the best show I've ever done. I've done many shows great since. great show. Uh, I loved it. I had so much fun. It had a lot of meaning in conservation and inspired a lot of hope. But it, what was what I killing hope. myself for Animal Planet for? You know, they, they yeah. don't kill you. They don't kill themselves back for you. You know what I mean? Like, no, you, well, it's, it doesn't does, matter. Does, <laughs> does, it, like, does you're Animal Planet even yourself. exist? Does Animal Planet Not still really. exist? I mean, Not it's really. dying. It's, we don't know. Yeah. Look, I hope it comes back because Animal Planet used to be a oh, very important part of yeah. everyone's television view. If you love wildlife, all places, you love Animal Planet. It was a great vehicle to introduce people to it. A lot of shows are wonderful. Central Live is a terrific show and you should Thank be you. proud of it. Um, I was, very. I am, am but, not but, was. But it's it's it is it is one of those things, um, you know. I'm just trying to think of the time when uh, oh god, I was in the army. I was a paratrooper, and we did a big exercise. It was supposed to be in the wet season, and we're up in the northern territory, so we're just south of Indonesia, we're in the northern most northern part of Australia. And uh, now we're elite paratroopers, super fit, super well trained. We have very clear objectives. This is a, an international exercise of many different countries, many different. We were teamed up with the SEALs and we, we're working with them. So 
we get there a couple of weeks early. We get flown up there a couple of weeks. We're training. We're out there acclimatizing. We're running every morning. This is before the whole thing kicks off. We're running a little bit later every day to get used to the heat. We're getting our bodies hydrated. And so by the time everything kicks off, we're in country. We are 100% ready to go. Yeah. And what I noticed was there was a bunch of army reservists who came in. Now, this is our day-to-day. This is every day. We're regular soldiers. We do this for a living. Yeah. Then we get these army reservists in, great guys. This was their passion, but not their job. This was kind mm-hmm. of their super hobby. And God bless them. I love the army reserve. But they're only going to get a couple of weeks in the field. And right. so – they just jump in trying to make the most of it. They right. weren't acclimatized. They probably they're weren't frothing. quite fit enough. Yep. Yeah, they're absolutely foaming. Absolutely. Frothing and foaming, whichever of those uh, visuals you appeals to you. Um, <laughs> was it the – what uh, it was uh, like the, uh, the book of uh, the emperor Marcus Aurelius talking about the beauty of the glittering foam in the mouth and the jaws of the boar. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like that's exactly what it was. Yeah. So we ha- we didn't – things weren't quite set up. We, we set up field beds for ourselves because we were going to be there for a while. A simple tripod out of three branches lashed together. Uh, stretcher poles down the side of your stretcher. Now you got a bed off the ground. Snakes galore. This is some of yep. the most venomous sure. snakes in the world. King brown sure. snakes, taipans are all there. So we cut all the grass around our tents. Oh, no, I say tents. We, none of us had a tent or even a hoochie. We just laid in the open. But the point was mm-hmm. most snakes, not all, most snakes – will not like the feel of moving to normal grassland to mown grass. They'll just say, this feels weird, I'm exposed, the bird's going to pick me off, and they'll head back in. It's the right. easiest thing you can do is to clear <laughs> the brush and grass from around your beds. Takes, not takes a problem. five minutes. Exactly. So we were yep. doing that. Army Reserve guys came in. Within a week, there was half a dozen bitten by snakes because none of them you're had cleared kidding. the, the brush kidding. around their beds. And, oh. another, and at least that many with heat stroke from not being fit enough and not having acclimatized and not being hydrated. And now these are rookie mistakes. So yeah, no kidding. It, in these case, in this case, the answer is not having a not no, enough knowledge. Now I, I often talk about this in the context of, of any kind of, of, of achievement or goal in that you can time travel is possible in the context that you can be in a place in your life where it's as if you were 10 years ahead of everyone else, if you just do that much more work than they are. Instead of yep. doing the nine to five, yep. you then put in a couple of hours on your own, on your own project, outside yep. of work, outside of 100%. study. 100%. And, if, and instead of writing an article for the student newspaper, you write it to a higher standard and sell it to an actual newspaper or a magazine right. or a website. And now you're a year or two ahead of your peers and it keeps going till finally you get out and you spent the same amount of time and sure you've sacrificed some social outings and a few beers or whatever. But by the time you finished, you are years ahead as if you've traveled into the future, future you is already here. So there's a way to beat, beat an ignorant rookie is just to ask questions and to watch what the professionals are doing. And, and I felt for them, they learned that the hard way you can't just turn up in the tropics. If you're not a hundred percent fit, you haven't taken your electrolytes, you haven't got your fitness to a certain level, you're not hydrated, and then you do dumb stuff like sleeping in a nest of King Browns. It's, yeah. you're, not gonna, you're not gonna wake up feeling great. That's, that is the kind of error that a lot of people make and it's, it's 100% avoidable if you just ask people that know and humble yourself. What? And it's, it's a pride ego, issue. right? That's what I was gonna yeah. say. It's ego. You're like, oh, I got this. I don't need to ask. I'll do it my way. And I think I, I had a lot of learning to do with that early on in my TV career as well, because I, I didn't mm. like to ask for advice on how to produce something or how to present something. I'd be quiet and listen and learn from others, but I'd be like, follow me. I know how to do it, which I didn't. <laughs> I was just faking it till I made it. And um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And, that, and in hindsight, it's just young arrogance and ego. And it's like, Jesus, I wish I'd just listened more and you know, spoken less. And I would have learned so much more, so much more quickly. But every, I think everybody feels that way, don't they? I, 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 they absolutely do, which is why there's no shame in it. It's, it's, right. it just own it and grow. And but again, reduce the likelihood of casualties. You get bitten by a king brown snake, you don't feel great for a very long time, and it's if probably going to survive. Gonna, if, if you, you make survive, it. Yeah. if you survive, right. and so and and you know, heat stroke, you can come back from that. But there are there are situations where you may not know you have a medical uh, issue until you push to an extreme by being venerated by a giant snake. And I've seen King Browns, uh, you know, 11 feet long and a body as thick as my forearm. 
I mean, yeah. this is the, you know, heavy as a dog. I remember picking one up. We killed one on patrol once. It came at us. We almost stepped on it, and we had one of the one of the uh, one of the paras cut its head off, and it was still you know ten feet long, and yeah. it just it, it felt like I was picking up you know a medium sized <laughs> dog is how heavy it was. That's a lot of don't argue in a state. Speaking of pride, I'll give you a funny example that happened to me. I may have mentioned this before. I was I used to do these VIP tours of a zoo that I loved. And again, I'm not going to name places that get associated with my shameful uh, mistakes. <laughs> um, and what I meant by that is that I would, for free, turn up and take potential donors on a private tour of this facility before yep. it opened, interact with the animals and the keepers, in exchange for which they would make a donation towards conservation programs. And then I'd take them out for breakfast. And I did this a lot. And we raised, sure. uh, I wouldn't say hundreds of thousands, but certainly tens of thousands of dollars doing this for these programs. And so it's something I, was very, I enjoyed doing, and I was very glad to support the facility this way. So I'm doing this one time, and we go to the back of the house, which is not normally, none of this stuff is on display. It's a beautiful little green area with mm -hmm. trees and shrubberies. And it's a lot of orphans, a lot of injured animals, a lot of, uh, um, you know, native animals that we're going to release maybe at some stage until they recover. Stuff, yeah. Wing. Yeah, all that. So, you know, you've got koalas and wombats and, and old manner cool. of wallabies and kangaroos, and so it's pretty cool. awesome. Yeah, it so I'm in the back, it. And there was a, a number of, uh, of koala joeys to adolescent size. And you weren't allowed to touch them because we do want to put them back into the bush at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were very, very close. And I'm gesturing up at this particular Joey and telling its story. And it just pisses right in my face, right <laughs> in my face. <laughs> and I, I think this influenced actually one of the episodes of Adventure Beast. Actually, there's this almost exactly what happened is in the, is in the animated <laughs> show. And I don't know how many animals have pissed in your eyes, but I put it to Not you that, that not <laughs> nothing is as bad as um as 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 a koala because the diet being 100% eucalyptus leaves right. the residual amount of of of, the of eucalyptus yeah. it's still in the urine as well mm -hmm. as regu I mean oh my god the pain was it was <laughs> hilariously bad now i'm trying to be cool about it and go yeah like it's no big deal everyone pisses in my face i'm fine with this so i'm trying <laughs> to shrug it off in front of these big donors and not make a mess of it and so I just walk over to this drinking fountain, splash it in my face and keep going and take, you know, wash my hands up. And then I go in and take them on the tour. They get right us a nice check. And I take them to breakfast. My eye went insane fairly quickly. <laughs> it, bright, bright red. <laughs> and you probably and, looked and, ridiculous too. And they were just like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> it's like just, just a flesh wound. And yeah. <laughs> um, so I got these bright red eyes like the Crypt Keeper, you know. And um, and so the funny thing was, I had to go on a book tour the next day and I didn't get a chance to seek to doctor. So I'm just putting in the over the counter eye drops and it eases yeah. some of the suffering for a little bit, but it's getting worse and worse. I end up getting through several cities, my eyes are bright red orbs of, of hatred until i get to the <laughs> other side of the country where i had a day off and i booked in to see an ophthalmologist and i'm so like my eyes are killing me it's, it's like closing my eyes on sand i got pus and junk coming out what's going on and he does these tests and it turns out that i had uh i had um i had a form i had uh, chlamydial conjunctivitis i had chlamydia oh, get out of here eyeball from chlamydia the, I had, yeah. And so it's not the same as regular chlamydia, but it's the same thing. The, the koala had chlamydia, which is a potentially fatal disease in koalas. I called the facility immediately and told them, and they tested them, and every single koala they had had it. And they oh, all wow. had to receive treatment because chlamydia is kind of a silent killer with koalas. With humans, yeah. I, it, it can have some devastating side effects for, for women, but for men, it's not often a big deal. It's easy to solve just with antibiotics. But this, anyway, so the urine with the koala chlamydia in my eye gave me this form of conjunctivitis. And uh, what was funny is at the time I wasn't in a relationship. I was sort of romantically dislocated. And when he first said, <laughs> you've got chlamydia, I thought he was joking. I went, ha, I wish. Right, right. Yeah. Which is a weird, a weird thing to say, no matter how far along <laughs> it was. Um, anyway, the point was, instead of being so proud, like this is nothing, and this is the lesson that I learned from it. Any interaction with animals, anything that goes wrong that could potentially involve infection, there is nothing that is nothing. It's always something, even if the something that it is is minor. 
Yeah. And it's always important when you ingest something that's potentially toxic where you get a scratch. Let me tell you, if you get opened up by coral or sea urchins Oof. or an animal's tooth, it's never nothing. Every time I Some ripped of my open, worst. there yeah, you that go. That was all fire coral. It all died all the way to my nipple, all over a little lobster. That's a dumb story. I can tell you that one if you're keen. I need but, that I mean, story right now. I want to hear the fire, st- I want to hear the fire coral to the lobster, right. to the nipple, the, the nipple desert. Hey, Brosters, thank you for being loyal subscribers. We appreciate everything that you do. And now we have a membership offer for you. I think you can get ad-free episodes, I heard. That's pretty big. Ad-free is big, but you can also get your comments looked at so we don't have to sift through the millions. How do you do that? Is there some sort of badge system? There's a badge system, a loyalty (laughs) badge. Boom. Shows up next to your name in the comments. Boom. We read the comment. All this badge talks. Make, I'm going to the badge store. He's going to get, get a badger. badger. He's going he's gonna to buy one. Didn't earn it. He's going to buy one. He did a fake leave. <laughs> well, I assumed Kyle would know to cut on the motion. <laughs> All right, let's cut now. That's, that's our ad. Here's one. You want to talk about something that just didn't fucking pay off, making stupid decisions. All right, when I was, uh, uh, I'm, I was 22 years old, and Jess and I, my wife now, traveled around the world together. We did 28 countries um, in 14 months. We just bounced around backpacking. You know, it's very common in Europe and Australia. It's not so common in the U.S. You just take off after college sure. and bounce around. Absolutely. Uh, we, we, the number one thing on my entire bucket list, my entire childhood, as long as I can remember, was to go and see the Komodo dragons in Komodo Island. Okay. Wow, yeah. Number one thing. I couldn't have been more excited for anything in the entire world. Now, Saved up all this money, got to Bali, did a few days in Bali at a hostel, booked a flight to Bintang Flores, the island right next to Komodo. Okay, this now there's like four seasons and stuff in Bintang. When we went, there there was that's what I've heard. I don't really know. I think there's some beautiful resorts. When we went, there was nothing, nothing, nothing. Land in Bintang, go to a homestay, which is just basically someone's house in Indonesia. And um, we have no money because we're backpackers. And I say, yeah. I'm going to jump in the ocean and go get us something to eat for dinner. And so Good. I hop in the ocean off the beach and I swim out. And I have um, Rife had just come out with their collapsible spear gun. It's like a spear gun that goes in two parts. It was the one thing I backpacked around the whole world with that and my mask and snorkel. Had you, you had you, had you dived these waters previously? Did you know what was Never. in there? Never, no, no clue. But you know, I dive a lot, but I had no, I know, no clue. I know, that's a good, yeah, that's a very mm. good point. And had I done a little more research, I would have avoided this next terrible thing that happened. Mm. And I'm mm. diving around, and I see a lobster. It's not big. There's no no size limits there. It's maybe 12 inches long. Little lobster under a cave. When you say a lobster, is it a Pacific crayfish? Or is it a painted cray? What was it? Painted uh, painted cray, I think, is what they yeah, have. Nice. Some Indonesian that, and they are delicious. By the title, delicious, oh, delicious. But it's small. It wasn't even worth killing, to be honest. And I see this lobster and I'm like, oh, perfect. You know, I'm only 10 minutes in the dive. I'll get a few of these. And this is this is dinner sorted. Mm -hmm, We don't have to mm -hmm. buy anything. So I I go down into the coral. I'm just in my trunks. I swim down. I see this lobster. Bang, shoot it, shoot it into the cave, pin it. Okay, and come up, grab my breath of air. Big smile on my face. I've got a lobster for dinner. Now I go down to retrieve the lobster. And the spear has gone through the lobster and into the rock under the reef. Okay. So the spear is wedged in. It's happened to me before. It's not the end of the world. I just got to work it out. I only have one spear, so I can't leave it. I can't bend it. I have to be very carefully get it. So I go down and I dive into the, into the, into the, the coral cave and I'm rubbing my arm like this against the side of the reef to try and work this spear out, right? Rubbing and rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. It takes me about eight dives. All for a lobster that's about this big, right? Doesn't even feed one person. Um, Takes me about eight dives of like grinding my arm against the side of this reef to try and get the spear out. Eventually, I wiggle the, you know, flopper closes and the spear pops back out and I get my lobster. Swim around for another 45 minutes. Don't see another lobster. I'm like, whew, that was a little stingy. That was fire coral. Well, what I didn't realize is this was a highly toxic fire coral that I had been grinding into my All skin. All the little stinging hydroids straight under your subcutaneous defenses. Brilliant. And I had literally been grinding it in dive after dive with no shirt. That mm. night, I come back, we build a fire on the beach, we grill up our one tiny lobster that basically gave us one bite each, had to buy a bunch of other food regardless, and go to sleep. I'm mean, stinging whatever, I think I pissed on it, you know, like just whatever, I'm a kid. <laughs> And so go to sleep in the homestay. The night comes around, sweating, just profusely sweating, throwing yeah. up, headaches, nausea, dizziness. I mean, unbelievable misery. And the sun cracks, 
and I can't get out of bed. And we're supposed to be on a boat to Komodo at two o'clock that afternoon from Bintang. Mm. And I tell Jessica, I'm like, I feel terrible. And she's like, what's going oh, on? No. And I was like, I don't know. I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, you know, mosquitoes in Indonesia. And I'm like, it's my arm and my chest. And she's like, well, take your shirt off. I go to take my shirt off and I lift my arm up. And as I take my shirt off, the skin from here all the way to my nipple, you can just see a little bit of the scar through the through the yeah, webcam, yeah. Ha has glued to my black shirt. And I pull it off right. and it rips all of that skin off. And it's just oh. black, dead oh. and festering from my bicep like, to like, my nipple. Like fried chicken skin, just peeling off. Peeling off. And it's black, black, black as the night sky. I've never seen such dead flesh in my entire life. Wow. And um, it, it's literally falling off in chunks, like, you know, the size of my hand, like just the So what did you do? What did you do at that off. point? Well, and this is the thing, because there's nothing on Bintang. So I say yeah. to Jess, like, can you please try and find help? And she's like, what do I do? And I was like, I don't know. Like, there was the guy who drove us to the homestay, spoke English. See if you can find him. Ask him. He's driving us back to the airport in five days. Ask him if there's a doctor on the island. You know, yeah. the next flight out is in is in two days. There was only flight every yeah. three days. Blah blah blah. Mm. Like, see what we can do. So Jessica disappears. She's she's 22 years old, five foot two, little blonde in an island that has you know no English speakers. She disappears yep. for like two hours. She comes back and she goes, "There's no doctor, but there's Excellent. a vet who's 20 minutes from here by car, and the taxi driver is going to take you to the vet." And I'm like, "Yeah, great, let's go." Uh, so we morning. load up. We load up, and this is the story is quite hilarious. We load up with the thing. I'm lying down in the back seat. I'm, I'm not moaning or anything, but I'm miserable. I'm sweating profusely. Yeah. You know, I'm just miserable. We go to the vet. It's a three sided building because one side of this, you know, like corrugated tin building, one side has been kicked out by a water buffalo that she was treating. So one side's just gone. There's three right. walls standing and a slanted roof broken down where the wall's been kicked in by the water buffalo. We go in, it goes from me to Jessica to the taxi driver, to the vet, who's about a five foot one Indonesian woman that's about 97 years old. Brilliant. And um, she, she, she hears the story, she listens, she looks at my arm, she shakes her head and she goes, you know, blah, 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 in Indonesian. And she goes into, I swear, if I'm lying, I'm dying. She goes into an unrefrigerated cabinet on one of the remaining three walls. There's nothing white, there's nothing sterile, there's no gloves. She pulls out a syringe that's clearly been used about 150 times in with that, a needle. In that water buffalo's ass, for sure. 100%. She goes mm -hmm. and gets a thing that's about this big uh, of medic of yellowy green liquid. She draws right. this massive, I mean, like a massive <laughs> syringe, like massive <laughs> syringe of green, yellow stuff. She looks at me. She does one of these, which means roll over. Pulls my pants down without asking, bam, right in the buttocks like I'm a water buffalo. I was ready to kick yeah. her other damn balls out. And um, no idea what it was to this day. No clue what she gave me, what the shot was. There was no follow-up. There was no anything from there. But sure enough, 30 minutes later, I felt a whole lot. She dressed my wounds after that. She, she's, you know, put, I think, just betadine and gauze on them. And, Probably some um, steroid cream and a bunch of things, yeah. Yeah, and no idea what was in this cocktail of drugs. Shot it in my bum. And... Um, and off we went on the boat to Komodo from there. Now, here's the thing. I felt much better after that. I think the, the flesh started dying and started coming back, whatever, whatever. But it ruined my two days at Komodo Island. You were in misery sick. and in pain? I was in misery. I was in so much pain. You're I had to lie down. I was yeah. full of poison. I had to lie down. And every time I lie down, the Indonesian guide would be like, can't not lie down here. The, the Komodos will eat you. So I had to That's get right. up That's right. It's the one thing you can't do. Crocodiles so and Komodos you can't do. never lie down. Yeah. One thing you can't do. And I, I like, and it was amazing. I got to see the Komodo dragons. I got to be close. I had these moments of like clarity and happiness where my childhood dream was coming true. But most of the time I was utterly miserable and sick to my stomach. And, um, and it ruined something all over a lobster and arrogance and wanting to save what was probably the equivalent of two US dollars ruined something for me that I had wanted to do since I was probably six years old. Now, it didn't ruin it. I got to do it. I got to see my Komodos. Sure, but the but, stupidity of yeah. forcing myself to try and save that spear, which was maybe 20 bucks you know, for the actual spear shaft, to get the lobster, which was maybe a value of two dollars, like all for pride, all because I didn't want to lose my tool, all because I wanted to eat something yeah. for free ruined yeah. something that i'd saved up for since i was 16 years old um and it was uh you know it didn't ruin it but it it, it didn't let the experience be what i wanted it to be and you and, didn't uh, have you didn't have stupidity. a first aid kit you didn't have a Nothing. first aid kit no i didn't yeah, have that's anything a, 
that's, I mean, that's the two things I take away from that is, and look, I've almost lost my nipple several times to foxes and, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, remember that? What was that animal that ripped it off? Um, was it oh, a beaver a or a badger? What was it? You told us that no. story. Oh, yeah, no. A, uh, well, an Arctic fox had a go at it. A, a Mexican jackfish tried to rip the other one off. And, but the one that really did, <laughs> tore it half off was a reindeer. Yeah. Like pissed off. <laughs> and right, and the, the antler just went through, and uh, it was, oh, I mean, wild. nipple cripple, nipple cripple to the power of infinity. It was, it was, it uh, was special. But what I take wild. away from that story, uh, that epic adventure horror story, it ways it could have gone better, knowing what was down there. Yeah. Um, number one. Number two, having a proper first aid kit. Obviously, that could have been a game changer. But the third thing is lack of knowledge of, of, of that particular water. That's it. That's it's the one. It's just because the number one thing people don't realize uh, is they think that water and dirt are inanimate, and they're not. They're a biological entity. You can. There are places in the Amazon that grow soil. They take right. this topsoil off, they sell it, and they wait, and then they break down the compounds. Literally, the soil raises up like rising bread over a period of weeks because it is alive. It is full of organic compounds. Now, in the warm tropical waters uh, of yeah. uh, of the South Pacific, and particularly in the equatorial regions, the water is teeming alive. Alive. with microbes. And you, and whereas in other places, you're always taught, oh, you gash yourself, wash it out with salt water because that'll clean it. It is 100% the opposite. And yeah. even a minor injury in the sea it's like going back to the Wild West. You get a splinter and you die within a week you die. of sepsis. You get a tropical ulcer and it goes septic. Yes. And it's, it's, I had one, I had one from a spider bite in Papua New Guinea that's left a massive scar on the upper thigh that I won't grace you with. But it's from a little it, tiny zit spider bite thing that I popped with my fingers because uh-huh. I didn't like the little yellow head on it. Became sure, sure. This, this, this quarter size hole yeah. abscess in my thigh that just kept rotting and eating away more and more. And I kept debriding it with a clean blade and alcohol. Yeah. And eventually it stopped rotting the flesh away. But it was all right. because I decided to pop a fucking zit and get in the ocean. That's it. I mean, and so the the the, the tip, uh, the, the the basically the moment of wisdom here for for any of the listeners who are doing these adventures, like and and following in our ill fated footsteps, is pack a proper first aid kit. Yep. And a proper first aid kit is not one you buy off Amazon. It's one that you put together. It could be buy it off Correct. Amazon. I've got nothing against Amazon. But you put it together no, for the you specific it things yourself. you're yep. likely to face. Yep. And if you're swimming in equatorial waters, particularly in the South Pacific, you n- absolutely need antibiotics, both superficial and internal, and because you are going to get a horrific abscess anytime you cut yourself on coral, anytime you step on a sea urchin, anytime you cut yourself on land, even a shaving cut, um, and you go into the sea, little greeblies are in there ripping it apart, and you're going to get sick. So even if you hadn't have done it on the fire coral, got the stinging hydroids in your skin, even if you hadn't have, have just ripped open your skin just against the rock and the coral, you were going to get any kind of injury was going to result in a nasty. Um, I, I want to get some of that uh, that green goo that she pumped in your ass. Oh, it sounds like something wonderful. from the reanimator. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, I've said this, I've said this before, and it, it's it's a weird thing that you won't hear anybody else say, but I stand by it. I'm a biologist by trade. You're a biologist. We both we can probably agree on this, but the majority of people will not. If you understand the biology and the ecology of an ecosystem, you can accomplish anything. You can avoid True. anything. You can do anything in that ecosystem. The reason that I was so successful in that stupid naked and afraid thing was not because I was a great survivalist. I'm not, I don't know shit all about survivalists, but I knew every piece of flora and fauna in that habitat and could utilize it to such an advantage that the producers were pulling their hair out because I was having so much fun because it was so easy because I understood the flora and fauna. If I had understood the marine flora and fauna of Bintang Flores, that's a lot of flu. Uh, I would have, uh, I would, this never would have happened. I would have looked and gone, no. nope, that's fire, Carl. Don't shoot that lobster or leave my spear alone or cut the line or whatever. But instead, as a stupid, arrogant 20 something year old, I looked at the habitat, was like, yeah, I know most of my fish from the South Pacific. I know most of my Carls. I'm just going to go for a spear and get a lobster. Yeah. I didn't even know this various species 
or pay attention to the hazards like the types of fire coral and how bad some of the fire coral is in that part of the ocean. If I had just known the flora and fauna the way that I thought I did, because I thought I was an expert because I'd read a few field guides and not studied them properly, none of that would have happened. And that is the same case for everything the world over, in my opinion. If you understand the flora and fauna, you can thrive in any habitat. And so when we when we talk about, you know, being considerate and, and or considering your plans, we're not advocating temperance or hesitation in order to avoid doing things. No. We're we're suggesting you you take a minute to think it through because we want you to do these crazy adventures. We want right. you to explore the world. We want you to take some risks. We just don't want you to take stupid risks. One of the ones I got in trouble is from being curious and having too much fun. And I mentioned this before. Sounds like a drinking story. (laughs) I mentioned this before when, you know, I I get sick of overhyped stuff you get on memes on social media. And I I told uh, you and and Pat how the time that I tested out a coconut crab, see how bad the the pinch really was. Mm -hmm. It's it's really, really bad. It was (laughs) incredibly bad. And it was within a millisecond, I realized I made a catastrophic mistake. And uh, I was coming with desperate measures to remove this thing from my body. Um, <laughs> but but I did something even dumber at the same place in French Polynesia, near a place called Montefarioni. And that was when <laughs> I was been fishing. I've been fishing all day, had the best time. I got back, and when the tide starts to come in, there's these little gaps in the reef, and it washes, uh, you know, not just small fish and small marine animals, but it, uh, little tiny bits of detritus, little bits of rotting, mm-hmm. whatever, dead things. And it, and you get these sandy kind of, one of a better term, a runway of the sand that's being sort of washed in and out of these grooves. It's an area about, uh, I'd say, maybe 300 yards long, maybe 50 yards wide. And stingrays, giant pink Polynesian stingrays, come from everywhere to to, to vacuum up all this little <laughs> little detritus that ends up on the, on the floor. And they're quite harmless as long as you don't step on them. <laughs> so I say, can we get in there? And they're, yeah, how about it? I just don't even think. I'm so excited. I jump in. I mean, people can do swimming with rays all over the world now. As long as you're responsible, nothing wrong with it. Yeah, but of course. Anyway, I'm an idiot. I left this little bag of bait shrimp in the pocket of my swim trunks. So now <laughs> this giant ray, about four or five feet across uh, from wing to wing, with this massive barb in its tail, comes up, smells the stench of death near my groin, <laughs> obviously want some of that good news the next thing and you've seen the bony plates of a raised mouth it's a oh suck and crunch God. situation that you've seen oh. them get rid of a dead fish they can do it the next thing smash a th- smash a clam shell a, a hermit crab anything they'll crunch yeah it's sucking these giant hickeys up my thigh <laughs> it's got half of my testicle in its mouth I'm in agony. And what do I do? The giant slick pancake of the sea. I, how do you, you push it you back a little it. bit? If you hit if it, I hit it's going to whip you. Yeah. I'm going to get drilled. And um, so it was just one of the most imp- – anyway, I ended up with uh, – <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> it, it just looked <laughs> – I just, I just looked like – you know, basically it looked like a 200-pound leech had been sucking on my leg. I had these giant big uh, <laughs> bruises. And then, and then my scrotum on one side was almost black. It was just like like squash ball black, like like so like crazy. blood plum black and huge, just huge. <laughs> and 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 I just and I say to myself, you know, if I don't know, maybe you don't want to have your balls in the mouth of an eager stingray. All you have to do is take the dead fish out of your pocket. You don't be don't don't get overexcited. Take a breath, man. Take a breath. And a similar thing, I was proving a point, and you can watch this video on YouTube. I'm pretty sure it's on the Wild Times uh, memes account on Instagram as well, where I was proving how this invasive plant um, from Georgia in the United States that had taken over Polynesia was just choking the rainforest to death. And I jumped off a cliff to prove it because it's going to hold my weight. And at the time, I was a bit leaner. I was about 270, 280 pounds. And I just went straight through. And I did get. <laughs> I need to see this. I haven't seen this myself. Yeah, go to the Wild Times memes. That's very funny, and just like, oh my god! And I almost died because I, I there's little broken trees down below. I fell yeah. about I don't know about eighteen feet, uh, which, <laughs> and and it's just you know take a breath, man, is what I would say. Uh, and and I think we've all just like your story in Komodo. It's uh, these are the kind of mistakes you made when you get overexcited. 
you don't think it through. And the the, the one takeaway I take away from this, uh, the one takeaway from this one would be a similar situation when I was in the Pigeon, uh, uh, Pigeon Mountains in Australia. And we did this big hike and we'd taken a rope and some climbing gear just in case we mm-hmm. needed to do something. But we didn't think we would. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to get down and there was a series of small abseils, a couple of cliffs, and it would save us hours. So we decided sure. to do that. Sure. Um, and I, uh, one other guy who was more experienced than I am with mountaineering by a long shot, he had the gear, but he needed someone to go first. And I had done, obviously, a lot of ab- rappelling and abseiling out of helicopters, over cliffs, obviously in the military. So I, so he's like, okay, you go first because you don't need someone down to belay you. You can just handle right. it yourself. Yep. Threw on a glove, went down. Within about 10 feet, the glove had burned through. It was oh, rubbish. Oh, no. <laughs> this cheap rubbish. And this is and this is not one of these fancy little descenders that we have today that are so great yeah. where you just do it with yeah. your thumb. It's this a is palm. a classic carabiner yeah. figure eight yep. behind the bum. And I was in agony. And I was stuck on the side of a cliff with no other option. Now, I tried to double the glove under. I stuffed a handkerchief in. It took some time. I locked it off Oof. to cool it down. I changed hands. I ended up with a blister that ran around my entire hand and on my other hand from holding it. It was agony. And I think I was lucky in that I had a certain degree of training and a certain degree of pain tolerance. I was able to get down. But I would argue that most people or many people would have just lost control and fallen to serious yeah. injury or, yeah, or death. Yeah, because they wouldn't be able to deal with the pain in their hand. Yeah. And also, as you as it burns and blisters, the skin pulls off. And then it's wet yeah. with lymph and blood, and it's just very, very slippery. And so yeah. you'd be squeezing tight, not realizing so, that you're making it wetter and wetter and you're falling faster and faster. So, yeah, the, so, the, so again, the mistake there is assuming that having a superior body of knowledge compensates for poor equipment, and it doesn't. It, you, doesn't. You, it doesn't. So if I thought it through and saw what piece of garbage this glove was, I would have realized <laughs> I shouldn't even use as a glove or I would have doubled the rope through the carabiner and made it really, really slow. I could have basically walked down. So, And no if you had just least, taken that extra yeah. 30 seconds to look at your gear, you probably would have exactly. figured it out. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. I made the assumption that because an expert gave it to me that it was sound. Yeah. And whereas the responsibility – just as my bones and my flesh and my life are mine, I have to make better decisions. So in every case, the theme that I'm coming across here is <laughs> not knowing not knowing when to stop, not thinking things through. And if you were to do that, you could get through a lot of things, but also never making the assumption that an expert has control over it. And this is the last point that I want to make, and then I want to throw it to you for a final, a final uh, forest adventure. Sure. I One of my must-have most cherished animals in the world, whole class of animals, uh, what I call the goatzillas, the giant, the giant goats. You got your muskox, the biggest of them mm-hmm. all, and then you have, of course, your takin. And there are many different takins. Yep. Uh, the Szechuan is particularly one that I love. So these giant goat kings, gods. You know, a thousand, a thousand pounds, twelve hundred pounds, fifteen hundred pounds of goat. Goat attitude, yep. goat brains, goat belligerence, goat horns, goat <laughs> muscle, but huge. I remember reading everything I could read on Tarkins and there was not a lot out there. And they yeah. talked about how they were quite timid and because they lived in the range with snow leopards and tigers, they would defense would be to crouch down and hide on the side of these mountains. Completely false. Completely <laughs> false. They're one of the most aggressive and dangerous oh, really? of all. Yes. Oh, that's Hi- fascinating. Psychos. Absolute That's psychos. The most <laughs> <laughs> they're just and 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 we call them the goat oxes. By definition, they're a goat ox. Yeah, cat, cattle we, goat, right? Don't they call it a cattle goat yeah, or a, something like that? That's, yeah, that's right. It's it's and it's so it's it's like this giant. I said goatzilla is a better name. And these, <laughs> much better. <laughs> these, they're so intense. Anyway, so I had a friend at a facility that had these. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to name the facility. And I wanted to go look, and this, these are just smashing into the wall as you go past because yeah. they're just to just to beat you up. They don't run from tigers; they attack tigers oh, wow. uh, as a group. <laughs> I mean, they're terrifying. Anyway, I was just thrilled, and I was just saying how this was completely at odds with what I'd always been told. Right. Um, so I was so excited to learn something that I couldn't find in a book. And yep. anyway, I get in there, and they're doing a vet procedure. They had to give some uh, immunizations or whatever it was to this calf or a kid, I guess it is. And, um, 
And uh, and so they we wanted to get the mother out of the shed, and then they would close it off. Anyway, I, being me, offered to help. I said, look, I played a lot of rugby. My granddad was a dairy farmer. I've, I've, I've grabbed countless calves. Not a problem. And they went, okay, fine, help out. Anyway, this thing, they, they, they get the mother outside, slam these giant heavy gate door across, you know, this classy barn door thing. It's yeah. heavy. Mm-hmm. It's thick. It's on these rails. <laughs> and and this thing's running around. We're trying to grab it, making this all look pretty stupid. Um, you know, a lot of missed tackles. I finally get it in the corner. I get it in a great ball and all tackle. I got my arms around it. I pull its foreleg back so it can't go anywhere. Yep. The vet was fantastic. And he's in there, boom, two shots, bang, bang. We're good. As that happens, I'm hearing this pounding <laughs> on the side of the barn. <laughs> and like a, a, like a sledgehammer the size of a car. Just She's just running into the barn wall at full speed, smashing into the door, trying to get it off. And she does. She oh, knocked no. the entire barn door off the rails onto oh, no. everyone there. And I just feel this sunlight hit the back of my shoulders and I hear this roar from this, this <laughs> talking mother. I'm like, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm I'm holding this baby. I'm 100% dead. Yeah, and there she's was coming for s- you. Yeah. <laughs> seven other people in there and they all kind of scream. And I pretty, <laughs> this is I'm wild. pretty sure. Sh- I'm pretty sure I heard my penis whistle, you know, an alarm. <laughs> like, like someone stepped on a hamster or something, you know, that's a high-pitched whistle. <laughs> and uh, and they scream, and they're fighting with the door, this giant barn door. I'm talking, you know, 10-foot by 12-foot sure. door in iron and wood and pushing it back. And her head comes through, like sort oh, of no. Chewbacca and Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway, <laughs> they finally managed to push it back, all seven of them, and we released the animal and put it back – uh, with his mother and everything was fine but my point is in this instance you've got a wildlife veteran a physical you know veteran like myself who can handle tough situations and pain and knows how to tackle and knows how to get hurt knows how to hold animals you've got some of the best wildlife people there are running the whole thing you've got plenty of backup and it still went wrong yeah and that yep. is the nature of what we do is exactly accepting right. that no matter how much how, no matter how much you know and know how well equipped you are, something can still go horribly wrong. And to expect that rather than letting it surprise you, that would be my closing adventure, my closing thought, expect it to go wrong and it will go wrong less often. Yeah, that's, that's a good thought. Um, all right. Well, I have a zillion, but I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell a door one. You reminded me of a good barn door style story. Okay. I don't think I've ever told this story publicly before because it, it's, uh, it's pretty gnarly. We Ooh. two two years ago we were capturing and moving. We were translocating that herd of elephant in Mozambique. Uh, we oh, we captured. Yeah, it was incredible. One of the best things I've ever done. Caught twenty four rogue elephants and moved them into a national park to save them from human wildlife conflict. And in doing so, we hired three helicopters, two lorries, you know, a bunch of uh, all kinds, like just hundreds of personnel, millions of dollars of equipment. You know, we put our entire series budget into basically one episode because I felt like it was the right thing to do for the elephants. Mm -hmm. And we had to fabricate these massive elephant transport containers. Okay. So you imagine a big lorry, a big semi truck with the, uh, with the shipping container on the back Mm -hmm. and this conveyor belt system for moving a tranquilized elephant in and then waking them up. And the back of it, are doors that are about this thick with steel. They're, yeah. you know, as tall, they have to be taller than the tallest elephant. So they're, let's call them 30 feet tall, you know, and sure. it's two doors that take about eight guys on each side to push them together. And then you latch, 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 right? And then the elephants contained within that transport container. Mm. Now, if you imagine these sliding doors that come in and out on this long transport container, there's got to be some kind of stopper to keep them from going too far open, right? That, that would make sense. There's like a, some kind of a, a brake system or a latch or even just a piece of cord that stops the doors opening too far, falling off the tracks of the rails and coming down. Right. Each one of these doors probably weighs the equivalent weight of three small pickup trucks, okay? Because oh, we're I, talking about, yeah, you have I to contain absolutely elephants. absolutely believe it. Yeah, you have to oh, contain yeah. elephants, you know, and, and multiple elephants, not one elephant per container. We're putting like four elephants in a container. So these angry doors, elephants too sometimes. Angry, pissed off elephants, bull elephants, matriarchs, everything. 
Anyway, I tell you all of this because we go on this incredible thing. We, 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 we have all this equipment and guns and there's lions in the bush and there's elephants trying to trample us and we're jumping out of helicopters. I'm literally tackling, you know, baby semi sedated elephants to get them on the ground to fully sedate mm. them, ripping trunks out from elephants so that they can breathe when they're sedated. I mean, incredible, right. incredible yeah. adventure. And the thing that nearly killed somebody was one of those doors. And I'll explain it. We're on like oh, hour 26 of elephant capture, right? Because this is once you start, you go. You go all day, you can't. all night. There's all no the drugs and the, yeah, you, you, can't, you can't keep anesthetizing. It's, it's a very delicate exactly. procedure, even for exactly. a, a, basically a, a living mountain. You've got to be careful. Exactly. Exactly right. So we're on like hour 26. The last elephant, the bull, is put into the transport container. He was the hardest to catch. He was the, the most weary. The last elephant's put into the transport container. And, um, He's put into the container and we're going to the doors are like half open. We're pushing him in. Sorry. No. So he's on the conveyor belt about to go in and we need to open the doors. My cameraman, mm. JQ, who I think, you know, he's sitting yep. there with his camera and we're like, get the doors open, get the doors open. They're the last elephant of the whole thing. And, the, we, you know, six guys on this side, six guys on that side. And we start pulling the doors apart. Somebody has forgotten to latch the no. little tiny piece of cable that stops the, the door from going all the way out. And it goes out, 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 and falls off the track this way and Shut up. just manages by some one in a million odd miracle, the little, you know, those, those bolt S, S hooks, what that yeah, S yeah, hook yeah. caught the door just randomly, just literally captured Random. it and it balanced on it. Like and JQ was shot sitting there, yeah. like wow. literally just like, just caught the lip of it. And this, this, this door that weighs three, th the, the weight of three pickup trucks drops and stops before falling down flat. And JQ is sitting there with his camera like this filming and just looks up and the door stops right here. Wow. It would have crushed him yeah. into an utter pancake i mean there's no like oh maybe he would have been okay it would have no. just broken his back i no, mean instantly no, no, dead no, no. instantly dead there's no question about it. there's 100%. no surviving from that not even a no. not e i mean he would have I, been dead in a millisecond and this i've seen that happen with a, with a i'm gonna sorry, say go I, I saw that happen with a horse float just a horse yeah. float the metal right. gate on a horse float to run a big horse up yeah the hydraulics fell and it fell on a woman and she didn't die but she is I mean, seriously, Ruined physically handicapped. Yep. Yeah, it absolutely yep. crushed her. And that probably weighed 10% of right. what you're talking. Please continue. I mean, he just, he would have been dead. But by some miracle, this s beaner clipped on the, the little like bump on the door, held it up. And we're like, Jake, you get out of there. And he like jumped and moved after it had stopped, you know. And yeah. all of this happened because... We were in a hurry. We we're on our 26 hour of work. We were Tired. trying desperately to get the bull and we were exhausted. And even though there were 40, 50 plus professionals whose entire job is to translocate animals, one person, not one person, I should say, had thought or checked or stopped down for just the millisecond, for the half a second it takes to see if the chain was latched in the back to stop the door from sliding out. And that Jesus. very, very nearly resulted in me losing one of my absolute best friends in the world, an incredible cameraman, uh, someone with the purest heart for conservation, who was Man. just doing his job. He was just would have just been caught in a crossfire. And everybody there, and this is something I believe. I'm, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm not a big like energy guy, but that is karma because the world knew mm. that we were doing something good. Mother Nature, God, call it whatever you like, knew that we were doing something good. We were saving these elephants. And something miraculous happened to catch that door with that S-beaner. Took us an hour to get that door back up using a crane and back on oh. the rail before we could send the truck out. And That's JQ insane. was unscathed. Yeah. Well, I'm just glad JQ, I didn't know that he almost died. He would have died. And he would have died oh, in the most cool. horrible way. Uh, horrible. Horrible. I love, I love the idea that it might have been karma. I just think that, first of all, everything you said is true about the fatigue and the people make assumptions. Um, but I would like to think that you had done enough right to deserve that luck. Because the reality is, whenever you go out in the field and do anything, whether it's just adventuring and, and climbing or hiking, or whether it's with dangerous wildlife, there are a million things that are going to kill you. Yeah, A million things that are going to injure you very, very badly. And you can't, you can't be ready for all of them. Right. But if you take enough steps to be ready for most of them, Yep. the most severe of them, then you've probably done enough to survive what's going to go wrong because something is going to go wrong. I remember talking to Pat about how I defined extreme sports and the conventional wisdom is, yeah, it's dangerous, but it's fine unless something goes really wrong. 
that's not extreme sport to me. I define it as you are going to die unless everything goes right. That's uh, a very and, good point. And that is the game that we play. That is exactly yeah. the game we play when we go out and do these extreme adventures. That is what we're talking about. You can't be ready for everything, but if you can just take out the most severe outcomes that are negative, if you can, right. if you can somehow reduce those, right. then you have a very good chance of coming out alive. And that's what it takes to be good at what we do is to, yeah, we're, and I say that I've had 21 surgeries, seven treatments for <laughs> rabies, you know, uh, and you've, you've gone through a similar bunch of rebuilds and horrible injuries. We've all been envenomated by countless things. Our bodies are, are a biological melting pot of horrors. Okay, um, I am sur- I'm amazed that when I don't when I spit on the sidewalk, it doesn't just burst into flame to see what my body chemistry yeah. must be at this point in time. But um, anyway, mate, it's such a joy when we get to catch up uh, on the on the pod. Thank Absolutely. you for coming on Semi Indestructible. We got to do it again because I know that we both have hundreds of these stories. But yeah, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just you got to get out there and you got to live your life. you got to have fun with it. You have to take some risks. But if you're smart enough and tough enough and humble enough to put the extra effort in to prepare for right. worst case scenarios, That's right. the chance of the best case scenario is exponentially higher. Exactly. Take calculated risks for the things that you're passionate about and you'll never be sorry. I love it. Mate, thank you for coming on. Uh, I'm just so grateful to have the Bushmasters listening and looking forward. Next week's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about um, Rage and Death, one of my special <laughs> forces uh, buddies who whose mission was raining fire from heaven. You'll learn all about that. We'll have a lot more fun. Forrest, you're a legend. You're a brother in arms. Always good to see you. Thank you again for sharing your wisdom. Uh, this has been Semi-Indestructible. Uh, proudly presented in partnership with the Wild Times podcast and sponsored by Adventure Beast, the wildlife animated comedy series streaming worldwide now on Netflix. Remember, Bushmasters, life is short, death is forever. Get after it.